The following program is a presentation of the Civil War Broadcasting Network, available on the free YouTube channel Dr. E.C. Fields, on the Facebook page Kurt Fields as General Ulysses S. Grant, and on various other social media. Permission to copy and distribute is given, and indeed encouraged. Remember, you are the future of our past. And now, General Grant from Fort Donaldson to Shiloh. You find me here in my camp in Corinth, Mississippi, and I should like to talk with you about going from Fort Donaldson to Shiloh, but that's quite the journey. Uh, and I, I think it best to start from the end and work back. It is currently the 17th of July of 62. I have had <clears throat> my headquarters in Memphis, Tennessee, from, to which I had moved my headquarters from Corinth, but I've been called back. And taking, once again, command of the Army of the Tennessee. Something has been going on. There's been subterfuge of some sort by person or persons unknown being extremely oppositional to me and acting to my detriment. I don't know who and I don't know why. But uh, in complaining about this, to General Sherman in talking about this, he said something to me, wrote something to me that I should like to share with you. The moment you obtained celebrity at Donaldson, by a stroke of war, more rich in consequence than was the Battle of Saratoga, envious rivals and malicious men set their hounds loose upon you to pull you down from that pinnacle which you so richly attained. And then he said, by patience and silence, the whole thing can be quieted. So far, it has not, apparently, but perhaps at some point in time, I shall find out who has been my enemy in all of this. I don't suspect it's Henry Halleck or George McClellan, because there are not two men in this country under whom I would rather serve than Halleck and McClellan. But somebody is working to my detriment. But I had asked General Halleck to move my command headquarters from Corinth to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, I did so because he had taken my command from me. I was still the commander of the Army of the Tennessee, but Halleck had divided it into divisions, corps, between George Thomas and Don Carlos Buell and John Pope, and I was in command of the right wing and the reserves, but there under Thomas, and I had no actual command. So, I was about to resign. Sherman found out about it, came to see me, told me don't resign, asked for a change of headquarters. I approached uh, General Halleck about it, and he was more than happy to accommodate me. So on June the 22nd, I moved my headquarters from Corinth, Mississippi to Memphis, Tennessee. And I have had my headquarters there from June the 23rd until the uh, July the 15th, when I arrived back here at Corinth, Mississippi, whence I had been summoned. General Halleck had sent me a telegram on July the 11th, you will immediately repair to this place, report to these headquarters. And that's all he said. I replied to that same day, your telegram uh, just received, am I to repair alone? or take my staff, to which he promptly replied, 
This place will be your headquarters. You may judge for yourself. That's less than diplomatic, but he communicated his point to me. I uh, replied that I'll leave here at 10 o'clock. I have to go by way of Columbus, Kentucky. Julia and the children were visiting with me there in my Memphis headquarters. And I didn't know what I would be doing in the future, so they needed to be sent back to St. Louis. And I went back to Columbus, Kentucky with them where I could take the cars and get to Corinth. So I did that. I got to Corinth on July the 15th. And General Halleck sent President Lincoln a telegram on July the 15th. General Grant has just arrived from Memphis. I am in communication with General Buell and Governor Johnson in Tennessee to leave Thursday morning the 17th. And he left this morning, July 17th. Now, let me go back to the Battle of Fort Donaldson. <clears throat> Donaldson was surrendered to me on February the 16th. And Secretary of War Stanton, I understand, gave that news to President Lincoln that night, near midnight. President Lincoln promptly wrote, much to my gratification, a recommendation for my promotion to Major General of Volunteers submitted it on February 17th, and the Senate approved it February the 19th. So, uh, as of February the 19th, I am the second highest ranking officer in the Army in the Western Theater. I'm second in rank only to Henry Halleck. So, I am turning my efforts to taking Nashville. I was wanting to go to Nashville. Uh, General Halleck stopped me and uh, Flag Officer Foote at Clarksville, said don't go any further than Clarksville. He had General Don Carlos Buell with the Army of the Ohio coming from the east to go into Nashville and apparently he wanted Buell to take Nashville. Buell was not in a hurry to do so. I sent Bull Nelson, William Nelson, when he had come to reinforce me on the 24th, I didn't need him any longer. I sent him on to Nashville. He got to Nashville on the 25th of February, and they surrendered to him. Uh, this upset uh, General Buell because he wanted them to surrender to him, and in fact made the mayor and board of aldermen row across the Cumberland River to uh, Edgeware, Tennessee, and surrender to Buell on the east side of the Cumberland River, which was in Buell's military district, not mine. And uh, during this time, apparently, General Halleck, from this time being from February the 17th until now, February the 28th, when I got back to Nashville from a trip I made from Clarksville. And I had told General Cullum, George Cullum, Halleck's chief of staff, that uh, I was going to go to Nashville unless I got orders not to. I did not. I went and uh, was there the 27th, met with Buell, came back into Clarksville on the 28th. And on the 1st of March, General Halleck uh, sent orders to me to take an expedition up the Tennessee River to Jackson, Tennessee, Humboldt, Tennessee, or to Corinth, Mississippi, keeping in mind the railroad bridge there near Iuka. And uh, I didn't get those orders. So when General Halleck heard that I'd been in Nashville and, and had sent Buell on into Nashville, the city surrendered to him, he became apparently very upset with me and said, I, I thought you were in uh, Jackson, Tennessee. What are you doing in Nashville? So there was apparently some communication between Halleck and McClellan. And on March the 4th, Halleck sent me this telegram. 
you will place Major General Charles Ferguson Smith in command of the expedition and remain yourself at Fort Henry. Why do you not obey my orders to report strength and positions of your command? Well, I had a double shock with that because first, I no longer have a command. I have just won the first major victory for the Union in the war. I am on every newspaper headline across the country and enjoying something of some accolades. I've been promoted to the second highest ranking officer in the department under General Halley, and he suddenly and abruptly removes me from command and sends my army on up the Tennessee River, and I'm to stay for an indefinite period of time in Fort Henry. Well, I went to Fort Henry, stayed on my boat there, virtually under arrest. Uh, they just didn't bother to put any guards on me, and I'm waiting to hear. I went ahead and, and sent Smith on up the Tennessee River toward uh, Corinth, Mississippi, Savannah, Tennessee, actually. And uh, on the 5th, the next day after I was relieved of my command, on the 5th of March, I wrote a, a request to General Halleck to be relieved of command. And then again on the 9th of March, I again requested to be relieved of command. And on the 13th, I wrote him yet a third request to be relieved of duty because I wanted to demand a court of inquiry because I wanted to know who was doing this to me and to what extent and if possible, why. But on March the 13th, General Halleck replied to me, General Grant, you cannot be relieved from your command. There is no good reason for it. I am certain that all which the authorities at Washington ask is that you enforce discipline and punish the disorderly. The power is in your hands. Use it and you will be sustained by all above you. Instead of relieving you, I wish you, as soon as your new army is in the field, to assume the immediate command and lead it on to new victories. Well, now, from March the 4th to March the 13th, nine days, I'm in limbo, in the darkness, I'm now back in command. And apparently there's been communication with Washington too, so I'm, I'm really quizzical about this, but I left on the uh, 15th of March and arrived at Savannah, Tennessee on the 17th of March and was on the ground at the Cherry Mansion headquarters of the Army where General Charles Ferguson Smith had established his headquarters and took command. First of all, half of the Army is around Savannah, Tennessee. The other half has been taken to Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, that was a bad situation. I had all of those troops at Savannah move down to Pittsburgh Landing and begin training. Almost all of them were green troops that had not seen combat. And as the troops are coming down uh, or up the Tennessee River because it's flowing north and they're coming south, so they're going up river. Uh, some 170 or 175 steamboats bringing soldiers and materiel to Pittsburgh Landing. We intend to move on Corinth to take the crossroads of the Mobile and Ohio, north and south, the Memphis and Charleston, east and west. It's the most important railroad intersection in the country at this time. It connects to Mississippi with the Atlantic, the Memphis and Charleston, east and west, and the Gulf of Mexico, with the upper Mississippi, Mobile, Alabama, to Columbus, Kentucky. And, and we must have it. So uh, I am training troops there at Pittsburgh Landing, waiting for Don Carlos Buell to join me. He's been ordered from Columbia, Tennessee, to come to me at Savannah and join me some 85 miles. And, He's uh, apparently not in a hurry to get there and be under my command. He outranked me in the old army, and he chafed greatly at being under my command 
in these new circumstances. So I'm waiting for him while at Savannah while I'm training daily at Pittsburgh Landing, and I've got uh, Cump Sherman in command on the field there in uh, at Pittsburgh Landing. The issue with General Smith was that he had stepped from a boat to another boat, slipped and ground his shin from ankle to knee to the bone, even damaged the bone. And he was suffering from uh, probably gangrene and also uh, suffering mightily from dysentery. It, it's not looking good for General Smith to indeed even survive this. And uh, in fact, he did die on April 25th there at the Cherry Mansion. So I'm going to Pittsburgh Landing daily and coming back to the Cherry Mansion in the evening, waiting on Buell to join me. Albert Sidney Johnston has fallen back to Corinth, Mississippi where he is amassing a large rebel army, 40,000 or more. Now, I don't have any concern at this time in the latter part of March, going into early April, that Johnston is going to trouble me because military sense dictates that you don't leave a heavily entrenched position to attack somebody and give them battle in the open ground. And much of the area around Pittsburgh Landing is level open ground. Much of it is heavily uh, wooded and steep gullies and soaring ridges, but it's a good place to camp and train for the most part. Many of my soldiers have uh, never fired a weapon, and indeed they've gotten their weapons on the way to Pittsburgh Landing while they're on the boat from the Midwest. So, I thought that their time was better spent with the manual of arms, learning how to fire that weapon, than with the pick and the spade, digging trenches or building breastworks. Moreover, you must remember that this is the last of March, first of April. The war is only 11 months old. And there's never been a really large battle. And at that point, men were still of the mindset that real men don't hide behind anything. A real man stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with his enemy and fires his weapon. I will tell you that after the Battle of Shiloh, no one ever again held that belief, and uh, nor did they have any problem with standing behind a friendly tree or digging a hole. But before the battle, that was the mindset. In fact, uh, men would have thought that we were showing the white feather had we dug trenches or built breastworks. My engineer, Lieutenant Colonel James B. McPherson, said that because of the terrain, that trenches and breastworks would have to be close to the river and behind most of the army, out camped away from the river as far out as the old uh, Shiloh log meeting house, some two and a half or three miles from the river. Sherman had his headquarters there. So I, uh, I opted not to dig trenches or build breastworks for those reasons. And it, it also should be remembered that General Halleck had given uh, strict directions, do not bring on an engagement. So I was not in an offensive posture. I was in a training posture, uh, waiting for Buell to come from Columbia, Tennessee and join me, and then we would march. I had about 37,000 men. He was bringing some 35, 40,000 men. And when you have uh, Bull Nelson's 5,500 or so and Lou Wallace's 5,500 or so, we were going to have an army of about 75,000 men to march that 20 miles to Corinth. And I, I had the uh, comfort of knowing that Albert Sidney Johnston would not hit us in the open. 
as it turns out, General Johnston had a different agenda than I did. He didn't want to wait until I had 75,000 men. He decided to hit me with his 40 some odd thousand numbers went from 41 to 44,000 and he was going to hit my 35, 37,000 before we were double in numbers and uh, decided to hit me. Now, I had been going to Pittsburgh Landing every day to return at night. And on the 4th, on Friday night, the 4th of April, in a driving, blinding rainstorm, it's been raining for a week, <clears throat> I got word that there was a rebel force possibly attacking along Sherman's front. And I returned back to the landing and rode out to Sherman's camp. The Sherman and McPherson met my party and said, there's nothing to it and I returned to go back to the landing to go the eight or so miles down river north of Pittsburgh Landing to the Cherry Mansion. It was so dark, you could not see your hand in front of your face, and I had to trust my horse. I was riding Fox at the time, a, a good horse, and he lost his footing and fell on me. And it caught my left thigh and leg completely under the body of the horse. And my surgeon said that if it hadn't been so soft and muddy from a week of rain, that it would have crushed my left leg and probably would have been a fatal injury. As it was, they had to carry me on the boat. And by the time I got that eight miles or so downstream, my left ankle and leg was so swollen my boot had to be cut off of me. Uh, fortunately, it was not life-threatening, but uh, I had to wear a house slipper on my left foot. I couldn't get a boot on. And we are hearing rebels probe, fire their weapons. We even heard bands off in the distance. We knew they were out there. Uh, I knew that Johnston was somewhere close by. I thought it was a reconnaissance in force. I did not think, as I made it clear, that he would attack me. I was incorrect in that assumption. However, we did know they were there. We knew where they were. I couldn't have been more prepared for that attack if uh, General Johnston had telegraphed me and told me when and where he was going to hit me. So we, while we were not ready for them, we were prepared for an attack. At, I had told General Buell to get with me as soon as he got to Savannah. General Nelson, Bull Nelson, has already gotten there with his uh, division, and I'm holding him in readiness to move down the riverbank. Now, the Cherry Mansion is on the east side of the Tennessee River. Pittsburgh Landing is on the west side. So Buell is going to have to cross the river with the Navy amphibious assistance to get his troops across. And I've got Buell in readiness. I also have Lou Wallace with about 5,500 troops just a few miles, five miles or so north of Pittsburgh Landing at Crump's Landing. And that's a large supply depot for us. And I really thought if we were going to be hit at all, we'd be hit at Crump's Landing. So I'm keeping a contingency of between five and 6,000 troops there under Lou Wallace. They built a, a road, there's the river road that runs close to the river. Wallace and his men and troops from the camp at Pittsburgh Landing have built another road and in fact built a bridge across Owl Creek for a second route in case it's needed. So Wallace is in readiness to stay in place or to move south if needed. I've got uh, Bull Nelson there at Savannah, Tennessee, and I'm waiting for Buell to get there. And I told him when you get there on the 5th, come to me immediately. He didn't. He got to Savannah 
on the evening of the fifth, but did not deign to come calling on me. So I stayed there. The morning of the sixth, I had to get my crutch. I hobbled downstairs and was having breakfast with my staff there in the dining room of the Cherry Mansion. And uh, we heard the artillery at about six six thirty in the morning. And one of my staff members, I believe it was Colonel Webster, uh, looked at me and said, General, that sounds like artillery and a lot of it. And I said, yes, it does. And, and then it became more pronounced. And I set down my cup and I said, gentlemen, the ball is in motion. And I had the steam up, kept up in the Tigris, my command boat. And uh, we, I had to be carried down the very steep steps from the, the rear portico of the Cherry Mansion overlooking the Tennessee River and on the boat. So when we, I, and I gave orders to Bull Nelson, bring your troops down the river and to Pittsburgh Landing opposite and then come across. I need you. We passed Lou Wallace on the way to the Cherry Mansion and I pulled up beside his boat and told him, I gave him verbal orders, come as quickly as you can. The attack is at Pittsburgh Landing and come by the nearest road. And he said, we're all ready to go. And I moved on. I got on the shore there, the bank, 8, 8.30 in the morning on the 6th. And by this time, the cannonading is in full throat. Uh, there are also several thousand soldiers hiding under the, the ridge, the crest of the bank, coming down to the Tennessee River. Uh, I was not disturbed at this. Uh, I didn't consider them cowards because most of them were just boys. And most of them had never had anyone shoot at them, never seen the elephant, seen combat. And I thought, when you get over being scared, you'll come back. You'll be the good soldier that you were trained to be, that you want to be. I immediately gave orders to start moving ammunition to every commanding officer on the battlefield. And I was helped on my horse and uh, began to go to right to left from Sherman on the right near the Shiloh Log Meeting House, all the way around to the left, Hurlbut on the left, anchored against the Tennessee River, a line some three miles long. What had happened is the rebels had hit us in three columns about that three mile length, some 15, 12 or 1500 yards apart. And they were stretched out and coming in three waves. They had pushed us back from the outermost reaches of the uh, encampment, which was pretty much the log cabin Sherman's headquarters. Now, one Ohio regiment, I believe the 54th Ohio under Colonel Jesse Appler, was camped for whatever reason about 400 yards out past our outermost line. So Colonel Appler in the 54th Ohio was the first unit that was hit by the Confederates as they came out of the woods. They took the brunt and were swept away. Unfortunately, Colonel Appler had been sending warnings to General Sherman saying somebody's out here. And Sherman, after the second or third messenger, uh, lost a temper sent word back to Colonel Appler, if you're so afraid, take your damned regiment and go back to Ohio. He heard no more from Colonel Appler, uh, and that's unfortunate on General Sherman's part. General Sherman had sent me a message the night before. Uh, I don't anticipate anything like an attack from the Confederates, and they were just a few hundred yards away from them at the time, massing for the attack. Well, they swept us back. We gave grudgingly. Uh, 
as WHL Wallace's division was pushed back, uh, he was shot in the head and, and we thought at the time dead. And uh, Prentice, General Prentice, the same General Prentice who had uh, objected to my authority in Cape Girardeau back a few months ago in the summer, uh, is now in command of a regiment or so that uh, took up in uh, a woods next to a farm road near Duncan Field. And it became known that heavy woods became known as the hornet's nest for, I think, obvious reasons. I think the, the reports are, the word is that the rebels made something like 11 charges uh, against the hornet's nest before they finally took it in oh, somewhere around four o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock. I was there close to five o'clock and uh, General Prentice did not despair of surrender, but finally the rebels got around him, flanked him, and he surrendered some 2,500 men. But what he had done was to stall the rebel advance and give me time with Colonel Webster, my chief of staff at the time, to set up a last line of defense of artillery. Webster got the heaviest guns he could find on the battlefield and set up a perimeter running east and to west from the river facing the Confederates. And by this time it's getting dark uh, and the, the fighting is, is tapering off until darkness fell and the battle was over for the day uh, and we had held on. We were close to the river but we held on. Uh, the troops from General Nelson and the troops from General Wallace, neither one of them got there during the day. I had sent a message about 10 o'clock in the morning uh, with the quartermaster there from their landing and uh, he, he wrote down, the, I gave him a verbal order, he wrote it down. That order has disappeared, but I sent him to find Lou Wallace and said, come quickly, I need you. I needed that 5,500 men. And then later in the afternoon, I sent uh, General uh, Colonel at that time, Lieutenant Colonel McPherson, and I believe Lego, uh, my assistant, aide-de-camp, to find Wallace and they found him not far away. He had marched and countermarched and marched and countermarched. He got to the battlefield about 5.30 or so after the fight for the day was over. And even though he'd marched some 15 miles, he estimates, he came into the battlefield only three miles from where he was when I gave him orders, come as quickly as you can. General Nelson, didn't get into the fight that day. He waited at Savannah six hours before he marched that few miles, seven or eight miles south along the riverbank to cross over and to get into the fight. So it was the end of the day. In fact, he only got three regiments across the river before the fighting got too dark to see and the fighting ended. Uh, despite claims that General Buell has made that uh, he saved the Army of the Tennessee. The uh, casualties suffered by the Army of the Ohio on April the 6th were two killed and one wounded from the 36th Indiana. The other two regiments had no killed or wounded. So the Army of the Ohio had two dead and one wounded on the first day. The Army of the Tennessee had suffered 7,000 killed and wounded on the first day. We had secured the day uh, by the end of the fighting, uh, by the end when darkness fell. By this time I have learned that Albert Sidney Johnston is dead and Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard is in command. Beauregard's a fighter, uh, every bit the fighter that Johnston is. So I am prepared for another day of, of equal savagery to what April the 6th had been. About dark, the rain set in again. 
Now, all day on the 6th, Sunday the 6th, it had been a beautiful day. But come dark, it started raining again and came in a torrent, a, a, a real frog drowner, as they call it around Pittsburgh Landing. And I had, uh, after I secured the line, made my rounds with the commanders on the field, had gone back to the Pitt Brothers trading store, trading post, where I had had my headquarters to find it has been taken over by the surgeons and it's now a hospital. I tried staying in there to get out of the rain, but they were sawing off legs and arms and treating the most ghastly of wounds. And I, I was in that horror for just a little while and uh, I took the point of view that it would be better to subject myself to the elements than to witness that horror. And I went back outside and got under a tree and tried to stay dry. About midnight, uh, Comp Sherman came walking up, materialized out of the darkness and the rain. I was standing there holding a lantern, trying to smoke a cigar. And Sherman came up and said, well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day today, haven't we? And I said, yeah, lick them tomorrow, though. I couldn't see in the darkness very well, but Sherman looked a bit taken aback. And I found out later he had actually come to suggest to me that we retreat across the Tennessee River and put that river between us and the rebels. And uh, after an awkward silence, he said, well, I expect I should get back to your command. And I said, best you do. Have your men sleep on their arms. They had indeed collapsed on their arms from the exhaustion of the day. Uh, we will attack at first light. The, as I told you at Fort Donelson, there is a time in every battle when both armies think they are whipped. The army that moves first will carry the day. The army that moves first tomorrow will carry the day, and Pierre Beauregard is going to have to get up mighty early in the morning to hit me before I hit him. And indeed, during the day uh, when Don Carlos Buell came across the river, he said, well, General, what are your plans to retreat? And I said, well, General, I haven't despaired of whipping them yet. Uh, and he said, this is chaos. And he was shouting and yelling at the troops, hitting them with the flat of his sword and threatening to turn the guns on them and fire at them where they lay. And I thought, General Buell is of the old army and, and a bit rigid. He doesn't recognize the difference between the volunteer and the regular soldier. These men are volunteers. And they have not seen combat. They're not trained and drilled and veteran troopers in the manual of arms. They're scared. They're frightened them to death. And no amount of threatening, you could have shot them where they lay. They wouldn't have gotten up and gone back into that fight. But I knew that as soon as they got over their fear, they'd go back into it. They'd be the good soldiers, as I said earlier that they meant to be, that they wanted to be. They were just scared boys.